Okay, so officially we will uh, begin our uh, presentation um, entitled Nutrition Making Change. As you know, it's part of our uh, one year long wellness project that was uh, developed um, in collaboration with um, uh, Europe last year and uh, we're very pleased to be delivering this one. Typically January, as you know, is a time where we reevaluate all things lifestyle. And uh, so it's very timely that we will talk about nutrition and making change. Um, we've all also heard this expression of the COVID-15 and the amount of pounds people have put on, much like the freshman 15 when we all go off to college or university uh, and we come home at, uh, at Christmas being a little bit heavier. Well, we've had a year of, um, of change. Uh, so this is a perfect uh, opportunity to talk about something that is one of the many contents that the CAF delivers uh, to our demographic, just so you can interpret the information and decide for yourself uh, any changes that you might like to make, um, any um, additions or omissions that you need to make from with respect to the diet piece. So as I mentioned, the weather, feel free to use the chat room now. I'm online with my colleague. Cindy, and she'll be helping me manage the uh, chat. Um, at any given time, if you do have a question, uh, feel free to make use of that and or raise your hand and we'll be attentive to that. So, first slide. Uh, go ahead, Cindy, if you wouldn't mind in helping me advance through. Just a quick reminder that health promotion is made up of four main content areas and today's presentation is taken from the Nutritional Wellness Portfolio. So just an opportunity to remind you that we talk about lots of things in our delivery. We deliver events and campaigns and initiatives on all of the topics that you see on the screen. And today we are um, going to discuss concepts taken from the wellness, nutritional wellness portfolio. Okay, the next slide is our icebreaker. So I would hope that you would get involved in this one. I would like you to offer up in the chat the strangest food you've ever eaten. So take a minute just to write that in, the strangest food you've ever eaten. Often I hear shark as a, as a strange food that many people have eaten, but maybe there's something we haven't considered. Okay. Oh my, thank you Hugo for, uh, uh, for contributing, not sure why you'd ever eat a caterpillar, but um, thanks for sharing. And I'm glad to see some of the uh, the weather from previous. I just got my chat open, so uh, thank you for um, putting in your comments there. Any pigs in Peru, moose, bear, and mushrooms, yeah. Uh, bear, that's, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody in our courses eating bear, but that makes sense. Chocolate covered crickets. Uh, you're a chaperone for a girl kind of thing and you had to be brave. That's awesome. Um, sheep spleen, Rod, what were you thinking? <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody. Kangaroo, caterpillar. Okay, so it was in a restaurant in South Africa. Wild boar. Wow, this for sure, crocodile. Cindy and I are going to have to remember these answers because we've delivered a lot of nutrition presentations and these are some new uh, new foods. Um, so thank you. I would like now to hear from the group, if you could eat only one food for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? So one food for the rest of your life, what is it and why? Need to have an idea of who we have in today's course, today's workshop. Red. Okay, Sonia, you didn't tell us why. <laughs> Fresh bread with butter, pizza, yep, yeah, okay. No worries. Bread is a number popular, usually a number one popular uh, item. So comforting and filling, yeah, absolutely. So carbs, pasta, absolutely. A lot of comfort food being listed. Tacos, pizza. Okay, so far, do we have it? Oh, there we go. Sardines with white vinegar. Just kind of love them. All right. 
Pasta will never die. Okay, so there's a theme there. Other than our sardines, we certainly all like our carbohydrates, which is not a bad thing. We'll have an opportunity to talk about that. But thank you for sharing all of those, uh, all of those food items. A food that you don't like, you never ever need to have. A food that you really dislike. If you wouldn't mind sharing a food that you dislike. Canned tuna, fish, ah, there we go. Look at the theme there. Brussels sprouts, green peppers, dill pickle. Oh, we've got some green themes happening here. Root vegetables, foods you dislike, okay. I wonder, I wonder if root vegetables is an aversion because of, we're gonna talk about root vegetables because they're a big part of one of the fad diets that we're seeing a lot of people um, try. Squid, yep, I agree. Dislike, sardines, sorry, Jody, absolutely. Kidneys, okay, good. And the last thing, what is everybody's signature dish? If, if you had uh, company coming for dinner, let's just pretend that that's a, a thing that we're all able to do. You've got a company coming for dinner. What is your signature dish and what do they expect from you? Della says pasta with meat sauce. Yep. Okay, Suvlaki, good. Good. So we have some foodies on the line, which is awesome. Brisket, turkey, everything barbecue. Yep, chicken parm. Awesome. Tenderloin. Okay, good. So we have people that... Um, um, uh, like food, uh, you know what you like, you know what you don't like, and you're definitely known um, for your signature dish. We're going to now embark um, on the rest of our content, and uh, this information is going to um, obviously just help me get to know who's on the line, uh, but we're going to go back to it quite often because when we look at fad diets, you're going to see that nobody puts <clears throat> a certain shake uh, or a certain packaged food item from a, um, a, a, a large diet company, or those are just not the foods we tend to think of when we think of our best choice or things that we really have to have in our life. So if we can move to the next slide. Uh, this myth that has posted up talks about the, um, in order to lose weight, I have to be on a strict diet. And we just wanna make sure that this is our launch pad for today's workshop. Um, that most diets will absolutely uh, lead to behavior that ignore our natural feelings of hunger and they tend to lower our metabolism. So we become metabolically inefficient and we don't wanna be in that conundrum. We don't wanna go there. Uh, the deprivation that we tend to experience through a diet can lead to frustra frustration, which leads to, to you giving up, which leads to guilt. And then we have some low self-esteem and, and that cycle is, is not healthy. So our launch pad is to recognize right now that the concept of losing weight and being on a strict diet is 100% a myth. We're so fortunate that we have governing body um, in the CAF on nutritional wellness, and they make sure that we are uh, provided with the most up-to-date content on this topic. And, and this is not anything new. We've known this for a very long time. Uh, that the, the diet word really in the world of nutritional wellness is a bit of a swear word, that we, we just look at it as um, not a positive approach to what otherwise is, is a lifestyle choice that is about embracing uh, nutrition for the health of it. Okay, next slide. The slide's a reminder <clears throat> that in fact we, and this is Canada's new food guide, um, that when we look at uh, the alternative to a restrictive diet, we're looking to Candace Food Guide, which is very clear now that more than half of our plate should be from the vegetable food group. Um, about a quarter of the plate should be a lean meat or alter alternative, and then the other quarter of the grain product. And based on the icebreaker that we did, we do recognize um, how important that food group is, the carbohydrate or that macronutrient is, um, and, and you'll notice the Canvas Food Guide is a proponent of that. Big source of energy, and we also know that our demographic, the military community, uh, embraces the concept and the importance of physical fitness. So carbohydrates are a friend. 
Uh, and then you'll notice the Canvas Food Guide does recognize the importance of water. Our old guide used to list the picture of a glass of milk with a meal, and we've gotten away from that. Although we still encourage people to get their milk and alternatives, um, we are not such huge proponents of milk with meals. Um, we, we revisited that with this last rewrite of the Canvas Food Guide, and we want to make sure people are getting their fluids uh, as one of the many macronutrients. Okay, next slide. So this one just talks about cleansing diets. And you probably know somebody, maybe you yourself, have tried a cleansing diet. Uh, it's a myth that it's a safe and effective way to remove waste and toxins from your body. So there might be a reason why in the past you have tried that, and, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, the message is just so you understand from our Dietitians of Canada um, governing body, that there's no scientific evidence to show that it will maintain or improve your bowel health. It won't prevent your colon cancer and or help you achieving lasting weight loss. So you tend to be very efficient at this. Uh, so that's just a myth and recognizably one that uh, our governing body wants to share. The next slide. This one just reminds us of the, the cleansing diets. Um, they can also change your healthy bacteria in the colon um, and really interrupt the equilibrium of your, of your body. Now, there will be people that go through for uh, cultural religious purposes, a day of fasting or um, what would often be similar to a cleanse, uh, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking people that truly are doing cleansing diets for the purposes of the last two slides, so being mindful of that. Okay, next slide. So if a little protein is good and it'll help me gain muscle and lose weight, then a lot must be great. So the, the biggest myth probably we see in the world of physical fitness, um, and actually one of the, the statistics we see in the fitness industry, is that you could walk into any gym and you would probably interview 100% of the clientele there. Um, and we know that there is a huge proportion of people eating far too much protein because of this myth that's listed on the slide. They associate uh, muscle gain with protein uptake. And the reality is, is you have a ceiling amount that your body can use effectively. And certainly in the presence of protein, yes, our physical fitness um, will improve if we're doing our programming regime appropriately, but the reality is if you eat too much protein, you've really spent a lot of extra money um, on what we call expensive urine. So you would end up um, uh, excreting the extra protein to no benefit of what often people are engaging for the purpose of this muscle gain. So just being mindful of that. And there is a nice little equation um, that research shows a healthy adult needs about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Um, and then we look at our activity factor and how often you work out. And even if you were at the highest level of activity, um, you're still not needing uh, more than that ceiling listed. Um, which could increase up to as high as two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And, and as the slide mentions, anything else is, is just uh, waste and potentially stored as fat. Okay, next slide. If there are any questions at any time, please feel free to put them in the chat. And both Cindy and I are watching that. We'll make sure we can address that. So healthy snacking can fit into a healthy diet and would not impact weight loss. This is a fact. <laughs> Excuse me. Many times over the of the span of my career in the field of wellness, uh, we've seen lots of different messaging, and this, in fact, is is um, a fact that healthy snacking can fit in. But for so many years, we would hear practitioners in the industry talk about how you know you need to um, get out, get rid of those snacks because they, in fact, add in extra calories. Um, so we just need to be mindful that the industry has, has stayed clear on the decision that it's the number of calories that counts, not necessarily when you consume them. Uh, if you are generally hungry, then you should eat. So we're going to talk about good choices, great choices, and choose rarely. We're also going to talk about how often intermittently people are trying to eat um, and, uh, and just being mindful of this particular myth fact. Okay, next slide. 
fasting is a healthy way to lose weight, that's a myth. So again, if it's for cultural religious purposes, we're not we're, we're not addressing that. We are addressing fasting as a way to lose weight quickly for that purpose alone. Um, so there's a lot of um, industry uh, knowledge out there and a lot of information that's being thrown at us and we're going to we're going to address that right now as far as the intermittent fasting. So that has become very popular. If, if tomorrow Cindy and I were to go to any unit on the wing uh, at CFB Trenton, we could bet that probably at least 25% of our population it is is probably subscribing to an intermittent fasting approach. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, social media pressure out there and it pops up in all of our feeds. Uh, the reality is, is the CAS position, and they've come up with a one pager on intermittent fasting. The CAS position on that is that our military community and our military member is regarded as an athlete, a high performance athlete in uniform. So we need to be mindful of, of all the things that can happen as a result of that fasting and that it may not be conducive to operational effectiveness. So that's the messaging from the CAF, but Dietitians of Canada also say um, it is not a healthy way to lose weight quickly. Okay, next slide. Red flags of a fad diet, everybody probably knows this, but as a reminder, anything that promises that fast weight loss, that more than two pounds. So, um, you know, in Canada, um, we, we were very aware uh, probably in the last decade of the Bernstein diet as an example. And, and if anybody talked to you about the success they had on that, uh, they would talk to you about how they lost about 20 to 30 pounds per month. Now, there is an application for some um, restrictive nutrition plans based on your medical practitioner's requirements. But in regards to an example of the Bernstein diet, that might be one that did promise fast weight loss. So it'll recommend in, in some cases a very low calorie diet plan and there's way more than just the one I mentioned. That is just as, as consumers so we're aware of what the red flags are. It in fact could ban a whole food group and the CAF and our nutrition portfolio is very adamant that eating all of our food groups is actually going to set us up for success when we look at micronutrients. So if we eliminate any um, food group, we are also eliminating many micronutrients. So we, we may miss out on essential vitamins and minerals. So that considered, the rest of the red flags are listed. Um, for example, does not tell you about the risks, um, may not offer support or follow-up, um, and uh, I'll let you read that for yourself. Okay, next slide. So questions to ask yourself when you're considering this, this concept of a food nutrition approach. Can you see yourself following the program plan for life? Uh, have you enjoyed the change lifestyle uh, long term? Can you see yourself enjoying that lifestyle long term? Uh, can you see yourself being successful in the program? We often, in one of our courses called uh, Weight Wellness, the Lifestyle Program, or Mission Nutrition, we often call it, um, we ask people that question, is there a food you can't live without? And it, it, some people will say, yeah, tomorrow you told me I, I can't have pasta or I can't have pizza or I can't have one of the many things that we saw in the icebreaker. Um, that would eliminate a lot of the fad diets that are out there. And that, as, as our subject matter experts in Ottawa reminds us, uh, that is not the approach we're taking. We're taking a look at food um, as fuel uh, for our health. And we saw that with the most recent Canada Food Guide rewrite, um, that we're really starting to socialize ourselves to food and, uh, and, and taking a different approach. Okay, so the next slide. Uh, we're gonna just quickly review some of them and we're gonna look at the pros and cons. So there will always be an application for an individual that perhaps we can't, um, we can't uh, change your concept of. For example, your medical practitioner may say, I want you following this strict nutrition plan for the next two months as a result of um, your 
body mass index, as a result of your risk for heart disease, as a result of diabetes, as a result of, so some of the things we're about to say, uh, we just need a little bit of a disclaimer that we are affording you material information that you can now make an educated choice about. We are not saying absolutely not, don't follow these diets, we're just making sure uh, you're empowered with the knowledge to make your own decision about that. Okay, so next slide. And again, the next slide. So you may have heard of Isagenics. Um, years ago, I remember we, at Eight Wing Trenton, we offer a huge event called Surf and Turf. And it's much like many other bases across the countries that run a um, athletic event to, to encourage the esprit, uh, esprit de corps and, and the physical fitness regime of many of our military members. Well, I remember sitting at my desk when the promo came out for our upcoming surf and turf at in Trenton. And one of our biggest sponsors was Isogenics. And I knew right away that we might be uh, in hot water a bit on that because Isogenics is not the messaging of the Canadian Armed Forces. It's not the messaging of Dietitians of Canada. And it was in conflict with a lot of what we wanted our military community uh, to decipher about nutrition science. So Isogenics, although it may be applicable for some people, it's a company that sells nutrition products. It's a company that provides solutions that address global issues like obesity, aging, and financial stress. And it comes in the way of shakes. So next slide. Uh, you're gonna see that there are, there's a 30-day cleansing and fat burning system pack. You're going to get shakes, you're going to do uh, detoxification, you're going to get what they call natural accelerators that burns fat, and just the 30-day cleansing approach is about $400. So just making you aware of something that did have um, quite a bit of traction in the last decade, depending on how many reps lived in your area or knew about it, um, but certainly something to be mindful of. The next slide. Some pros to it, obviously people were seeing weight loss. Um, vitamins and minerals, so there was less risk of nutritional deficiencies. Some pros were there was protein and, and it did help with satiety, so the more protein we ingest, uh, the more satisfied we are after mealtime. There were some cons, so weight loss could be in some cases very drastic. A 240 calorie meal is not enough, so take for example any uh, calf mess, any any food services um, uh, entity within our lines, we have what's called a standardized cycle menu and most of our meals, our entrees are at about four to 500 calories. So this in fact was about half of that. And this particular diet does sell supplements that are not based on science, not sustainable long-term and it's very expensive. Okay, next slide, Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers is actually, when you look at the next slide, which talks about pros and cons, uh, we don't have a lot of cons to say about Weight Watchers. Um, it's about points, which does, for some people, make it a little bit complicated. We want people to be socialized to food as food and liquid as liquid, but it does break everything down into points. Um, there's no limit on the amount of fruit and vegetables, so that's not a bad thing. There are weekly meetings and weigh-ins, which is about uh, extrinsic and intrinsic motivation, not a bad thing. Designed to help you lose up to the two pounds a week, which we also know is not a bad thing. Uh, next slide talks about some of the cons. Uh, it could be time consuming when you're trying to decipher the addition and the math of, of how much you're eating. And you can feel at times pressured into getting involved with all the other things that Weight Watchers may make available to you, and the maintenance portion. So the Dietitians of Canada, our SMEs in Nutrition in Ottawa, they're all advocates of that maintaining a lifestyle change that's lasting. Um, this might be one of the cons that this diet review hasn't considered entirely that maintenance piece for when you come off of this, what that looks like. So overall, not a lot of cons, uh, and certainly many of the concepts of this particular diet are much like what we are infusing into our nutrition uh, courses, our mission nutrition, our top fuel for top performance, 
uh, our weight wellness lifestyle program, very similar um, and not as um, drastic of a weight loss as some of the other ones that are getting some traction. Okay, next slide. So the paleo diet, but I would also include keto because, again, if Cindy and I were delivering uh, at a unit on the wing today, if we did a hands up how many people are following keto or paleo, we might see anywhere between 25 and 50% of the hands go up. So um, if there are any questions specific to that, feel free to, to ask away in the chat room. Um, but we're going to decipher the paleo slash keto approach and let's look at the next slide. So uh, just just as a reminder, when we were doing our icebreaker, somebody wrote in root vegetables and root vegetables as a as a rule uh, tend to be part of the keto or paleogenic uh, or paleolithic diet. So that's why I asked that question that maybe somebody was so sick of of following a keto approach, which was only allowing you to eat a root vegetable. Uh, but you'll see what the slide says there. Uh, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, healthful oils, meat, fish, poultry, eggs, avoid all grains, legumes, potatoes, dairy, refined sugar, and refined vegetable oils. So definitely an example of a diet that restricts a food group. It also re res restricts um, alcohol for most uh, for most examples of the diet approach that people would 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 go for. So imagine delivering a workshop to a room full of 50 um, uh, military members and more than half of them are following keto and the other half of them are saying, are you seriously not ever going to have a beer again? And, and they will say, no, 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 this is short term. This is just short term. So we do often get these questions that that you know, um, I, I only have to give up my my favorite thing, the carbohydrate that I enjoy, for a short period of time, and then we would look at the bounce back from that. So not maintaining that success over a long period of time. Okay, next uh, next uh, slide. So also known as the caveman stone age hunter gatherer diet, um, there are some really good messages about this approach that we do need to look at the benefit of protein and fruit and vegetables. So if this diet were to say, let's place more emphasis on certain food groups, um, then it probably wouldn't be met with uh, resistance. And there, it's not going away anytime soon. I, I would hazard to guess that keto and paleo diets are here for, for a while. Um, we just need to make sure you understand, our, our demographic understands, we all understand um, some of the cons about it. Okay, next slide. And there they are. So uh, it could cut out a whole food group, could, which could lead to nutritional deficiencies. High protein for some could be very expensive. Uh, you know, if you're having to supplement your protein intake with cans of tunas and chicken breasts and protein powders, somebody's shopping list just got very expensive. And and the other thing is it doesn't, it's not a proponent of physical activity, um, which is which is problematic for national defense because we embrace the importance of not only nutritional wellness, but the importance of our physical fitness into our daily lives. So not a bad thing that it encourages us, us to eat less processed foods and more fruit and vegetables. Um, not a bad thing that it uh, doesn't involve calorie counting, um, but just making sure that you are aware of some of the cons. And there will be some people, you may have even tried it yourself, that have had great success on it. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we get it that the application of a keto or a paleo diet, um, it's not a one size fits all, but there are people that are seeing um, uh, physical and medical and physiological positive changes from it. We are about making sure you can decipher the information to make the right choice for you on topics such as this. Okay, next slide. So what is best? I, I um, have been at this for a very long time, over 15 years with PSP. Uh, and prior to that, many years with the Heart Institute in Ottawa and the Ottawa Athletic Club and the world of um, uh, 
fitness. And the reality is, is this message, message has not changed. Our healthy eating habits, that's what we're heading for that are sustainable, something that you can do for a long period of time. We want people to be socialized to the importance of a balanced meal. We don't want people to ever have a snack that is just one food group. If, if in an hour from now I was hungry and I had an apple, um, we know that if, if that is all I'm gonna have is a snack, then about 30 minutes later, I'm probably gonna be really hungry. If I had just had an apple with some nuts or seeds, that might've been different. We want balanced meals with all the food groups. We wanna decrease the processed foods. We wanna to listen to hunger cues. We wanna eat until we're satisfied, not full. And we absolutely want the activity factor in there. We want to be working out as often as we can. And, and look at what's happening even in the world right now from a priority perspective. When, when our communities are going into emergency stay-at-home orders, the only thing that we're deeming essential um, in our day is not socializing face-to-face, -face, but our exercise. So, of course, the CAF and National Defense is is a huge proponent of everything on this slide. The active lifestyle, the exercise, and, and really socializing ourselves to the nutrition science, that is the messaging. Okay, next slide. So some tips for success. Um, we wanna eat a nutrient-dense, balanced diet. So you can probably think of a night where, where you had a dinner and it, I joke that I will say to my family, wow, we had way too many orange vegetables tonight. We had carrots and we had squash and we had a turnip and, and that was not, uh, you know, although some people would say, wow, that's a lot of vegetables. We went with all the same color of vegetables. So thus it was not a comprehensive choice that would allow that diversity in the color, which also meant micronutrients. Um, we can be looking at it from so many different angles. So nutrient dense, yes, and balanced, all four food groups and a balance or um, a variety of vegetables from various different colors, from various different nutrient groups. Uh, the other tip is you have to move it to lose it. So we want in combination, our messaging has always been in the industry of nutrition and fitness, the messaging has always been in combination of a deficit of bad calories that we might eliminate and increasing really good calories in, in collaboration and a combination with exercise. Those two components, we eat a little less, we work out a little more, that is the recipe for success. We don't need specialty products. We want to be consistent, so no replacing hard work with quick fixes. Um, the messaging in our portfolio talks about nine times out of 10 make the great choice, but absolutely one time out of 10, have the food that you want to have, knowing that you have, have made 90% of the great choice and never saying never to something that in fact provides you a satiety, whether it be a comfort food and it's good for your stress management, or if it reminds you of a different time in your life, um, but recognizing that 90% of the time we're, we're going for a good choice. We wanna reframe thinking. So we don't wanna think of food as bad or cheating. We don't wanna ever use food as rewards. Um, we want to socialize ourselves to it um, so that we also start to think of it as fuel, as health. Okay, the next slide. This is a reminder, we've, we've talked about this in other workshops, but here is an opportunity and nothing like the, the first month of a new year um, to reevaluate what we're currently doing. So although some of you might be looking for nutritional change or, or optim, uh, optimal results with what you're ingesting, the reality is, is the behavior change in isolation, just nutrition, um, is, is not entirely the big picture. We want people to look at, yes, nutrition, but maybe other goals that they're trying to achieve. And that could be from activity level, that could be from stress management, uh, that could be from substance usage. Um, there are a lot of sleep, getting the best sleep. Uh, there are a lot of things that in combination with nutrition that this time of year, um, is optimal for. A reframe or a reflection, or maybe just an inventory. Um, an inventory of what we're doing, what we wanna do, what successes we're achieving, uh, and what ones we'd like to achieve. 
So this is just our SMART goal um, acronym. Every letter of the word SMART stands for a word specific. Your goal has to be specific, has to be measurable, has to be attainable, has to be realistic, has to be time oriented. So if I were to say I want to be able to run uh, a marathon in May, um, that might not be considered a SMART goal, although it's very specific and it's very measurable. Uh, it's not maybe attainable because I'm currently not running and I have a, a knee injury. So there would be an example of a behavior change goal that's not SMART. And unfortunately, when you look at a SMART goal, uh, the best way to regard a success is to, to break it down to this acronym. So. It, if you have a goal, now is an opportunity for you to consider those things. And maybe it's nutrition. Maybe one of your SMART goals for nutrition is to start looking at a balanced meal approach where you're getting all your food groups, you're looking at a diversity of uh, different types of vegetables. Maybe you're looking at bringing down the fat content in your meat or alternative. Maybe you're looking at having a vegetarian day a week. Maybe you're looking at having three days a week. Maybe you're even um, hoping to become a vegetarian. A lot of our governing bodies are proponents of adopting a semi-vegetarian approach based on the health benefits associated with that. So there are so many different um, SMART goals and behavior changes that and be considered this time of year, and I encourage you just to do an inventory for you. Okay, next slide. So making change last. So at this time, as you're considering um, any behavior change that you may have, is there anybody that wants to share um, a goal that they have, whether it be nutrition-based, nutrition activity-based, nutrition activity and, and maybe we could um, chat about that as a group or share our thoughts about um, first steps or considerations. Anybody have a new year goal re relative to what we're talking about? Maybe it is nutrition based. Maybe it's in combination with an exercise regime. Anybody wanna share something that they are working towards making change or an area that they would like to um, make a slight modification to. Okay, that's good. My son wants to cut back on chips and pop and eat healthier. So now eat healthier and there's probably a bigger goal there. I think he's an athlete, right? So can he attribute the healthy piece to success in his sport? So. Some of it may be the motivation piece and the connection of cutting back on chips and pop, which is going to um, impact the bottom line, which is his athletic performance. And or it could be his cognitive performance. So that's a great, great behavior change for consideration. Only healthy snacking for the next 30 days. That's a good one. In our house, we've decided to um, only have uh, non-processed foods for uh, snacks. So we're not going to buy any cookies from the grocery store. If there's a cookie in the house, it has to be homemade because we know that we will eliminate a lot of fat and a lot of preservatives just in doing it from home. Uh, cook more and cut out processed foods, eating too much junk. Okay, good. Awesome. So cutting out processed foods is going to be huge in just the substitution of processed out and food first in is going to eliminate a ton of fat and a ton of sodium because in order for a processed food to stay on the shelf for two years or with a best before date of two years, um, it's infused with a lot of extra calories that, that we're not looking for. Um, so that's a great approach. Eating lots of different colored vegetables and increasing. Yeah, that's a good one, Cindy. Um, and I know, as I mentioned in our house, I'm all about the color of the vegetables and my family thinks I'm um, not right when I when I say that. They don't get it. They're like, well, half of our plate is vegetables. What's the big deal? Um, we just need some of those um, dark red and dark green vegetables on our plates. And unfortunately, in my house, it's, it's all about the color orange. Um, healthy snacking, son wants to cut back on chips and pop. Yes, yeah, so I think I've covered off. Those are all really great. Oh, wait, we're trying to make healthy choices. 
including our, okay, so Kendra's suggestion, um, that is one of the biggest strategies um, that we can implement from a family perspective in getting the nine-year-old involved in meal planning. Not only meal planning will save your, save your time management, uh, it also save a lot of heartache if your family knows what you're eating when, but absolutely great choice to get your children involved in what that looks like because now you're socializing them to not only the nutrition piece, but what they're eating and why. That's back on cheese and wine. So messaging is don't ever eliminate cheese and wine, which that's good. You said you're just cutting back um, and a more varied diet. Drink more water, weakness for dessert, sweets. I want to try to cut back, replace with healthy alternatives. Yes, and cooking together helps too. Anybody do a, a vegetarian approach? Anybody having success with vegetarian days, meals? Um, and it's okay if we're not. That from our messaging from our governing bodies is starting to be, if we talk about fad diets, uh, there's a healthy approach to our diet is just looking at ways that, uh, <laughs> not from our house. Um, oh, good. So I did see we try once per week. Awesome. That is that is the messaging that you know the the trying some uh, some change, some variety in your meal plans, um, and and encouraging that approach to make sure you're getting a balanced meal um, without meat uh, and going with the alternative approach. Okay, next slide. So the next slides are gonna give us all sorts of things to consider. Um, the first one here just talks about our standardized cycle menu. So some of the CAF initiatives, and they've changed over the year. Um, we used to have uh, Set Your Sites, a program that you would see in a lot of the messes, but now we have come up with menus that at every, as mentioned a few slides back, that if it doesn't matter what base I go to, that I know that the meal is going to prepared, be prepared with a limit on calories, a limit on sodium, and and a balanced approach to the food group. And the standardized cycle menu is extremely helpful to have. That was a healthy messaging that was implemented over five years ago, and uh, and it is stuck. So you may go, you know, um, you may go to a um, Wing Foods. Uh, entity and have other choices than a standardized cycle menu. So maybe it's pizza day or it's fish and chips day, um, but they are meant to be preparing those meals um, with a very standardized approach, which is good because then we don't have to um, worry about uh, who's considered how much salt or fat or we're taking in. Somebody's considered it on our behalf. Um, okay, and sorry, I just saw Amanda's message, struggling to increase veggie intake. Some people have success with putting vegetables into recipes where you're, you're basically just mincing the vegetable up and it doesn't take on. So for example, Cindy and I have a colleague, she will make us like a square, like a cake, like a, um, it might be like a little chocolate breakfast bar and it is full of vegetables. She doesn't usually tell us until afterwards because we would have no idea that she's infused them full of vegetables. So sometimes it's finding um, access to some recipes that get the vegetables into you um, without it being just um, that choice. Yeah, carrot cake. Good one, Rod. <laughs> okay, next slide. So some, some foundational eating tips, quick tips. Next slide. So we want to try not to get too hungry. Uh, um, oh, good point. You go sorry to see chat. The air fryer recently changed his life. Uh, absolutely, um, we're seeing this as a healthy approach to cooking food, um, and um, and certainly making um, um, vegetables and certain food choices easier to eat. Um, and and people are having a lot of success with that. So thank you for sharing. There's a good strategy. Uh, and 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 you're getting a little push from Hugo that you do need one. Okay, so try not to get too hungry. So so here we go ha having uh, 
um, a lot of industry chitter chatter about fasting. And one of our messages is try not to get too hungry. So um, if you've got somebody in your household doing intermittent fasting, uh, they might be getting too hungry and that may change um, their interest in certain foods. So next slide. Try something new. What a great opportunity right now, new year. Um, new you has always been the tagline that we've used in the world of behavior change. But here's an opportunity to try something new. We, we got really good with infusing kale into absolutely everything. Kale chips, kale in our salads, kale uh, infused into so many of our recipes. But there are a lot of great things out there that perhaps you haven't considered trying. Um, and, and now would be a great opportunity to give it a go. Next slide. We've already talked about this, but we're going for color because we know that's directly related to the micronutrient value um, of the vegetable or fruit. And it's funny, I just said vegetable and fruit in the order that Candace Food Guide says it, but for the longest time, the food group used to be called the fruit and vegetable food group. And um, Health Canada got wise on that, that if we switch the name of the order of that food group and we call it vegetables and fruits, we're also letting the world know that the priority is on vegetable. We want you to get your fruit servings, but we really want you to get your vegetable servings. Okay, next slide. Dried beans, so great way um, for our overall digestive heart health, um, making sure that we are, are looking to other food sources that we haven't considered. Supplement, uh, that, that the satiety piece, the palatability piece, or sorry, yes, the satiety piece, when we look at ways to maintain our hunger levels so that we don't overeat, um, anything fibrous like that does help the digestion process and, and makes us feel satisfied longer. Next slide. Portion sizes are important. So we always use, always use the example of the Tim Hortons, uh, proud to be Canadian bagel. Uh, a Tim Hortons bagel is four serving sizes of grain products. Now, that's not to say we're against the Tim Horton bagel, um, but we are just mindful um, that, um, we're mindful of, of what that does to the rest of our day for serving sizes. And then you take a look at how portion sizes have changed over the years with some of our fast food entities. So for example, what was a Big Mac years ago, we would consider a Little Mac um, because now our, our Big Mac truly is big and those portion sizes, we think we're ingesting something that used to be a certain caloric intake, but in fact, everything has been supersized. Okay, next slide. So include both soluble and insoluble fiber. Can't say enough for our colon health and our heart health. Uh, fiber is our friend, so making sure we're getting that. Um, and we can get that, um, obviously, if we're following the balance, balanced food approach and we're getting all of our, um, our uh, food groups. But again, if there are certain fad diets out there that eliminate carbohydrates and maybe bread is no longer in the equation, um, bread or cereals um, or brown rices or whole wheat pastas, then we are gonna miss a lot of the fiber that otherwise is keeping our colon healthy. Okay, next slide. Um, the new food guide reminded us of how important this is that there is there is a window here for all of us foodies that like to um, prepare food and then present food, that there's this socialization piece. Have fun with food. Not only is it our fuel, but it is our health. And it can be, an, it can, there can be an element of, uh, of that looking appealing, that aesthetic of what food is. Okay, next slide. We want to make sure we're getting enough protein. Unfortunately, um, the statistic in the industry is there's a certain population, and that's people who do a lot of lifting, weightlifting, they tend to get enough protein. And then some of us that put way too much emphasis on our cardio regimes, we tend not to get enough. So just know how much you're getting by maybe logging a day to see how many grams of protein you're getting and weigh that against the 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight to make sure uh, you're getting enough. If you're working out a lot, you're gonna multiply that by a factor of two 
and that will be how many grams total per day of protein that you need. Um, so some of us know who's getting enough, like meaning just as I mentioned, if you're doing a lot of heavy lifting, you're probably getting your protein intake. If you're not, you probably could benefit from taking a look at what you are getting. Uh, unfortunately, they do break it down um, by gender in the industry statistics and female population as a rule, uh, unfortunately. Um, they're stereotyping a bit, but it's all based on scientific uh, knowledge that we tend to not be getting enough. Um, and, uh, and that is slowly changing, but that is something that the statistic has been around for a while. Okay, next slide. Vegetarian dishes, I already talked about that. As I mentioned, I was associated with the University of Ottawa Heart Institute for many years. And our dietitians and cardiologists would come in and say, we're huge proponents of vegetarian dishes. And, and, um, and we would recognize the um, lipid profiling approach to why that was important. Okay, next slide. Healthy fats. So we know sometimes it's just a matter of making a very subtle change. Something as small as um, uh, looking at your fat content of certain meats. So if, if let's say you're heavy on marbled meats, if you were to substitute out some of those marbled meats for leaner cuts, you could eliminate uh, many calories, but also you could eliminate some unhealthy fats. So there would be a, just a tip. Next slide. Antioxidant rich foods. So again, here's our colorful um, fruit choice and making sure that we are benefiting from. Sometimes it's easy to go seasonal because that's what's always available to us, but looking um, for non seasonal type vegetables. My in laws in the last week have been asking me because I do a lot of their grocery shopping for them because they're in their 80s and they're staying at home, but they love to make their marmalade and they've been asking me to watch for Seville oranges and not something that we would get very often, um, but there would be an example of, in my house, how uh, my children were like, what are Seville oranges? Um, you know, there are so many varieties of oranges once you go looking. Um, so there would be an example of just a different type of fruit. In this case, we're looking at blueberries, but different types of berries and the antioxidant richness that are found with them. Okay, next slide. Fresh whole fruit over juice. Okay, so um, I'm going to go back to Mike's comment about his son, who I think is an athlete um, and is watching his nutrition intake. That would be potentially the one example, so our youth population who are athletes, who we would not want to discourage from supplementing their daily intake with a juice. So for the most part, juice is the first thing we want to eliminate and go real fruit. But for our younger population who might be athletic and competitive on, say, some sort of organized team, um, fruit juice might save them as far as getting, or vegetable juice might save them as far as getting their servings. And it might get to a point where they can't eat enough fresh fruit or vegetables and they may have to drink it. But that would be the one exception where we would say, don't worry so much about the juice. Uh, for the adult population, we would always say, as the slide indicates, choose fresh whole fruit over juice. Okay, next slide. Watch for our in-season foods. Um, cost, certainly availability, um, certain considerations for that, uh, but that should also mean you still look for things that typically aren't available. And uh, boy, um, food literacy, and as far as the whole concept of cost, too, that's a whole other topic. Um, but the other pieces are in-season foods tend to be a better price. Okay, next slide. Garlic. We know there are a lot of health benefits to garlic, and uh, we just want to make sure that we um, continue to prepare foods considering garlic. Next slide. Onions. All of these things that are really great for our, um, not only our metabolism, but our, our health overall. So onions and garlics, making sure you are including those. Next slide. Eat freshly ground flax seeds. So years ago, we came out with this 
you know, I, I can't remember, it might have been Dempster's, good for them, they may have been the first out of the blocks to prepare a bread that was a flax seed bread. And I remember sitting in our presentation at the Heart Institute and uh, one of our dietitians stood up and said, I, I, you know, I'm really glad everybody is so keen on flax seed bread, but unless you're a bird, you have a beak, there is no way you're going to get through those flax seeds unless, of course, they've been ground or minced. So that would be caution to all people wanting to infuse flaxseed into their diet. Make sure it's ground flaxseed and make sure it's the little by little rule. Don't all of a sudden tomorrow wake up and decide you're going to eat a lot of ground flaxseed if that's not something you've done because your colon will, will speak to you in a way um, that will remind you that you should have done that progressively. So we don't have beaks. Uh, we can't bite through a seed that's not ground, so we want to make sure that um, we are getting that. Uh, oh, sorry, that we will have Lisa answer the bean question. Okay, and um, uh, flax seeds is certainly a heart healthy approach to adding in a nutrition item. Okay, next slide. So again, more of the vibrant, colorful piece. So that's just a. Um, another reminder of that. Next slide. Up your mineral intake through your greens. So um, our full course talks, of, we have this huge, amazing, we have this amazing slide that takes a look at absolutely every food group and every micronutrient. And boy, oh boy, the minerals that come from vegetables. So just making sure uh, that we don't leave out the color green when we're looking at um, uh, our vegetable intake. Okay, next slide, please. Um, share your favorite recipes. Absolutely. What an amazing opportunity we're in right now with all the virtual platforms and we're getting recipes on so many of our Facebook pages and our Instagram pages. What an opportunity for us to share favorite recipes, especially the healthy ones. You can probably think of a time where you ate something and someone said, and it's healthy too, and it's like double whammy. It tastes good and you actually feel great eating it. So share your favorite recipes, especially the ones that are, are, um, are recipes that, that hit both of those factors. Okay, next slide. Uh, reduce our sugar intake, that's nothing new, but certainly um, very timely. Uh, eat cruciferous vegetables, um, just a reminder, next slide. And how can you add more greens? So again, we see people have success with drinking their greens, um, but maybe it's coming up with a very tasty homemade recipe for a salad dressing that you enjoy with your greens. Uh, sometimes it is the, uh, the the sauces or the dressings that actually can change our like or dislike of a certain food. Next slide. Vitamin C rich foods. Certainly, uh, just as everybody knows, National Defense um, on the topic of a multivitamin, a multivitamin, multivitamin would always say eat your food. Um, rich with the vitamins, but in fact, if you can't, that's when you would look for that safety net of a multivitamin. Okay, next slide. So lycopene, one of the many uh, essential components, properties of a tomato, but making sure there's the red color. So there's some messaging here. We want to get every color, green, red, orange, yellow, you name it, we want a variety of our vegetable colors. Okay, next slide. Eat your vitamins. So we touched on that. You're going to get them ideally from food first. Safety net is having that multivitamin. Next slide. Shop when you're full and then cook and freeze. So those are two statements that are very popular in the world of nutrition science. We know never to go in a grocery store hungry. And we also know that when you do cook and freeze things, um, you are able to have that fresh component. Um, when, when a dietitian is asked, you know, what do you prefer, fresh, frozen, canned, a uh, dietitian will often say, if it's cooked and frozen, 
Um, that's a great choice. Obviously, the best choice would be to eat it fresh. Cook and frozen is also a great choice. Last choice typically would be canned, and I mean tin canned full of preservatives to give it a shelf life in the grocery store of about two years. Okay, next slide. Involve the family meal prep, and we already had that suggestion, so good, good news there, but that does help uh, with that socialization and education piece for all family members, and you're setting them up for life. Okay, next slide. Low-fat dairy, great opportunity to substitute out certain calories and get a, a more healthy choice. Next slide. These are just images to remind you, just from a calorie-dense perspective, um, carbohydrates and proteins are four calories per gram. Uh, fat is nine calories per gram. And right between carbs, proteins, and fat is alcohol. It's seven calories per gram of alcohol. So just from a nutrition perspective, recognize the caloric intake associated with, cal with alcohol. Okay, next slide. Take some time to enjoy your food. So that was one of the main messages of the new food guide. And almost done. Next slide. The path to a wholesome eating style is individual and you want to look for it to fit into not only what you're doing uh, in your lifestyle, but your food taste. And certainly for some of you, you might be in a country now that you're not used to being in. Here would be an opportunity to try new things, new tastes, new lifestyle choices. Um, so it, it is an opportunity for, for, for reflection and maybe trying new things. Next slide. That's the good news. And I think, Cindy, one more slide. We'll leave it at this very last slide. I leave you with the concept of one change that you can make. And by no means am I saying in that slide to pick the orange over the pizza. Um, we would say that every opportunity, that point of choice for nutrition, uh, nine times out of 10, we wanna go with a good choice. One time out of 10, you may, you may have the ice cream. We don't want people to ever think that they can't have a food item that they enjoy because we also know from a psychological perspective, if you say you can't have it, then that's all we're gonna want. So recognizing how powerful that is from a psychological perspective. And there was a question about bean drying. So some people have dehydrators, some people you can dry them in your oven, but you can also purchase them at various different stages. I'm wondering if that answers your question. How do you dry a bean? I would say in a dehydrator, an air fryer. I'm not sure if people have had success with an air fryer for that. Uh, for me, it's a dehydrator or oven, and or purchasing at various uh, levels of that hydration. Perhaps somebody from the participant group has had success on dehydration of a bean. What about room temperature to try to dry a bean? Sure, I think we can try to find um, uh, a better answer for that other than, or an additional answer other than the dehydrating machine, which are quite popular. We used to think people that did a lot of outdoor trekking um, were the only ones that were purchasing those dehydrators, but the reality is there's a lot of people who were very mindful of, of making sure that they had certain foods um, with shelf life available to them for certain applications, uh, they've become very popular. I know my daughter almost bought my husband one for Christmas. Um, so it'll be uh, something we can look more into. Cindy, you and I can try to come up with an article for uh, Amanda to circulate. Any questions at this time? 